So we're continuing our study on FBC PO. What does it stand for? Obviously, it stands for First Baptist Church of Port Orange. But as a church, we have to talk about regularly and remind ourselves, what are we all about? What are we here for? What are we to be accomplishing? What is the purpose of God planting and starting this church? Why did Jesus establish First Baptist Church of Port Orange? What are we to be doing on a weekly basis? What are we doing on a daily basis as his followers so that we can be fulfilling the mission and plan that he has set for us? And as you remember, we started, and if you missed any of these, you can go to our website, you can go to YouTube. They're all there for you to see and share. F is for friendly fellowship. You will meet everlasting life friends at church. Now, you might have friends from high school. You may have, you know, married your high school sweetheart, or you may have friends in your life that, that have been there for most of your life. But you know, it's only the friends that, that are believers that are everlasting life friends. And those are the best types of friends to have. And the place you find those friends is at church. Right? That's the place that God has called us together to build friendships. And so for us to be accomplishing this mission and goal, we need to be a friendly fellowship. We need to be open to new people. We need to be welcoming. We need to be encouraging. And we need to spend time with each other. We need to do things together. Uh, we need to be there for each other in the times of challenge and also the times of celebration. And so we want to be a friendly fellowship. We want to have opportunities for you to get to know the names and, and the stories of the people around you, their hurts, the things you can pray for them, um, their, their victories where you can celebrate with them. And so we want to be very intentional as a church that we're a friendly fellowship built on Christ. Second, we're Bible-based. And it's interesting to me, uh, we only believe the parts of the Bible we do, Right? We only believe the parts of the Bible we actually do, and we want to believe the whole Bible, so we want to be applying all of it to our lives and to the church, and we are Bible-based, meaning everything we do here, uh, whether it's our business meeting coming up in a few weeks, or uh, the decisions we make week to week, or month to month, or year to year, that it's soundly built from Scripture. If you were to participate, and many of you have in our, our Class 101 membership class, you're going to find almost everything I talk about has a Bible verse connected to it because we want it to be Bible-based. We don't want it to be the current trend or fad. We don't want it to be popular opinion. We don't want it to be what the culture tells us it should be. We don't want it to be something that has been uh, something new and fresh. We want it to be based in the Bible that is absolutely timeless. It is the same. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we want to base ourselves as, as a church in his truths. And so every decision we make, every stance that we have is Bible-based. And in the Bible, we, we learn of the story of our Savior coming to earth, Christ. And initially, our in, uh, focus becomes then Christ-centered. If Christ isn't at the center, it won't last. If Christ isn't at the center, it won't last. And so Christ is really the center point. We talked about him being the cornerstone, the stone in which the rest of the building focuses its attention because it is the stone of perfection. It is the stone of identity. And so we want to look at that in all of our lives and everything we do. We're Christ-centered. So when you come on a Sunday or you come to a Bible study, hopefully what you hear every time you're here in some way, shape, or form is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Death, he died for our sins. Burial, he was dead for three days. Resurrection, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. And that whomever believes in that should not perish but have everlasting life. If I am to repent and believe, I am eternally saved. And so our mission is when we gather, as you bring friends and family, or, or any time you participate in anything we do, you're going to hear about Christ and his gospel because that's our mission. Our mission is to share the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we're moving to prayer powered. Prayer powered. And so where do we get our power and our energy, right? Um, I, I tend to ask in our Bible studies questions and I try to find out when are people at their, uh, when do they have their most energy and when do they have their least energy. And that's a little bit different for all of us. But most people say in the morning they have more energy and in the afternoon they have little energy and then some people have a spike in energy at night. But we all have times of energy in our life, and that energy is completely based on our physical bodies, right? Our calories, how our body functions. But there's something deeper within all of us that's much more important than even our physical energy and our physical bodies. That's our spiritual life. So how do we fill the power and energy in our spiritual life? 
And that's where we have to look to prayer. And as a church, as we're talking about the principles of the church, what do we stand for? Uh, last week, I, my father was visiting, and we went over to the lighthouse. Uh, many of you have been over to the lighthouse, uh, Ponce de Leon, the Ponce Inlet, right? That lighthouse and all lighthouses are established to direct ships so that they don't go into danger or so they know where they are, right? And so we are to be the light of the world. We are to help direct the path of the world. We're there to be a source of, of understanding, a source of direction, and a source of protection. And so the question becomes, this lighthouse, how was it powered? How did they generate power to have a light shine so that you could see it from miles away? How do we as a church produce light into our culture? How do we produce light? We have to be connected to power somewhere, right? There has to be a power that is generating the force that produces the light that is seen by those around us. And so that's the question this morning is, why is prayer so important? Why is prayer so important? And I think as we look at these scriptures, we're going to see why prayer is so important. And so to apply the teaching this morning... Let us precede God's word with prayer and ask for understanding and energy in his, his world and his uh, truth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for another awesome day to be alive. Thank you that even in the midst of struggle and trial and, and difficulties, you are still good. We will not be disappointed in following you and Lord, that you are faithful. And so, Lord, as we turn to your word and we look at it, and Lord, even at this moment, this connection, knowing that you know my heart, you know our hearts, you know our thoughts, that, Lord, you created us for this. You created us for these moments of connecting with you and loving you and listening to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in a new way that you would inspire us, that you would stir passions, spiritual passions within us, and that, Lord, we would live lives worthy of being your children. So, Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts, give us understanding, give us wisdom as we study your words now. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the context of the church and we see this idea that prayer is so important, well, uh, if you look at the Bible, you're going to see the story of all mankind. And it begins in Genesis with the fall of man and, and sin entering the world. And, and then there is a time period where there's a great falling away, so much so that God looks at the earth and he says, everyone's thoughts are on wickedness continuously. And so he looks at the world and he sees a world that has rejected him and, and has uh, turned their back on him. And, and he uh, points and finds one man, Noah, and his family and, and saves them over a worldwide flood. And to promise his grace, to say he'll never destroy the world that way again, he gives us a rainbow. And this last week, I don't know if you saw it, I think it was Thursday, there was this amazing rainbow right over here on Beachside as I was coming back to get ready for the food pantry. And it was probably the most clear rainbow I have ever seen. And it just reminded me of God's grace. And it reminded me of his promise. And how did he fulfill that promise? Well, he spoke into a man's name, Abram's life, and changed his name to Abraham because he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And through you, the Savior will come. And he has a son, Isaac, who has a son, Jacob, who has a son, Joseph. And, and remember, Joseph helps the people go to a place where there's food in abundance in Egypt. But over the 400 years, they become slaves, and God raises up Moses to deliver them out of that slavery. And then he establishes the nation of Israel, which splits and is taken over by both Babylon and Assyria. So there's still problems. And they're waiting for this promise that God had given Abraham to be fulfilled. And so Mary is to give birth. And she bores Jesus. And Jesus grows and stature and understanding and at the age of 30 begins his earthly ministry and at the age of 33 goes to the cross and on the cross he declares to tell us that it is finished he's finished the mission he's paid for our sins he's made us right with God and he is dead for three days and on the third day he rises again 
The resurrection, the reason we're here this day is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he had his closest disciples, and his closest disciples uh, would gather now, uh, and he, he said, I'm here, I'm with you. And he said, behold, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. And so he sends them out on a mission of making disciples. And then he says, I must go so the helper can come. And he ascends into heaven. And then his gathering of those closest disciples are now trying to figure out what's next. What's next? What do you do when you don't know what to do? And this is where we pick up Acts chapter 1 verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers and so these are the these are the core group this is the start of the church these are the leaders you know I told you about Ponce, Ponce de Leon he was they built that because he was one of the originators of his mission this is the originator of this mission that God placed on earth through Christ, that his church would be planted and would grow so much so that it grew around the earth. And today we're in a building gathering in the name of Christ as a church body. Amen. And so it made such a major impact. But the reason it made such an impact is because it had power. It had an unknown power, a power that is beyond all powers. And how was that power received? Because the first church did the first thing the first church committed to prayer. They committed to prayer. And this morning, I want to look into that and say, why did they commit so strongly to prayer? If you read the, the New Testament, before any decision is made, and as you read about Paul and Peter and what they taught, they just said, pray before you do things. Prayer with thanksgiving. Bring your petitions to God. That there was a sense of prayer as an urgency, prayer as a necessity, and what they did at all times. And so there's a problem. There's a problem. And the problem is best revealed in Jeremiah 17, 5. And here's the problem. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart is turns away from the Lord. Cursed is the one who trusts in man and draws strength from flesh and whose heart is turned from the Lord. You know, as I read this passage, I recognize there's three elements here. First, it's believing in people. Second, it's believing in yourself. And third, it's rejecting the Lord. And I think the big challenge we have, you and I have in this room, are going to be these three challenges. Believe it or not, I'm almost at my 20th year of full-time ministry. That's how some of you are like, that's nothing. But. <laughs> but in the 20 years that I've been doing ministry, speaking to other pastors, speaking to people that are completely missionaries, completely committed to the ministry, the number one issue that I hear from most people in the church is they don't have a prayer life. It's hard to pray. Prayer doesn't seem real or beneficial. And I think it's a struggle we'll all have, if we're honest. And so this morning, I want to look at those three things and really uh, nail down what the issue is. Why is it hard for, for people to pray? Why is it difficult for us to make that commitment to prayer? I think the first part of it is revealed in the end of this verse where it says that they rejected the Lord, that they turned away from the Lord. And, and as I was thinking of this analogy of connecting to power, when my children were young, we used to get these little plastic plugs. Uh, and you'll see a picture of that here. 
little plastic plugs, and we would plug those into the outlets. Why? Because we didn't want the kids sticking their fingers or getting a little metal object, a little, you know, something metal and sticking in there and getting electrocuted. And so we would cover it up. Why? So they couldn't get to the source of power that could hurt them. But you know, as, as a Christian or, or even as a, a non-Christian, a lot of my views of God have to do with my views of my earthly father. When Jesus teaches us to pray, he says, my father who art in heaven, our father who art in heaven. And I think one of the challenges that we all have to grapple with, one of the challenges we all have to confront is do we take our view of our earthly father and then presuppose or place that upon God? Because some of us had no father. Some of us had very poor fathers. And all of us had flawed fathers. And so what happens is we begin to look at our heavenly father in the lens of our earthly father, and we begin to tell ourselves, he's never satisfied with me. He's always angry with me. He always has something to show me, to show me how I'm wrong. And if your view in your mind, if your view of God is a God who doesn't love you and, and, and draw you in and say, I love you, I know everything, I know all of the secrets, and I still want you to be with me, I want to heal you of that. If your view of the Heavenly Father is a Father that is not approachable, a Father that doesn't care about you, a Father that you don't want to go near, then that could be the plug in the socket that keeps you from the power and the relationship that is available to us. And so we have to, we have to, we have to allow the Lord. He is the one that we're to look at, not our earthly fathers. We don't build the picture about God by our fathers. We, we have a picture of God from his word, and then we look at everything else and judge it based on that. You know, my son, he's finishing up his football season, and he's doing really well. And I remember when I played football, they would, they would put in the newspaper that I was like a certain player in the NFL. And I'm sure if you went to the NFL player and said, hey, you're a lot like Mike Bailey, he'd say, Mike who? <laughs> you would never compare the pro athlete to the high school kid, right? You would never compare what, you should, what it should be to be a pro athlete to the high school kid. And it's the same with God. We should never look at God and say, he's like the dad that I didn't have or the dad I do have. The comparison doesn't work. And all that it does is it puts up a barrier. It puts up an unnecessary barrier between us and our Heavenly Father. And it can be impossible for us to want to go to that place of prayer when we've pictured God not to be who he really is. I think the second thing that this verse reveals to us is that we look to all the things around us for energy and power. And in this next picture, you're going to see an issue I have all the time. <laughs> all kinds of wires going all over the place, just a bundle of wires, right? And how long does it take to get this undone? But you know, in life, we're trying to connect into so many things. Well, my money will make me happy, and my relationships will make me happy, and maybe I'll plug into entertainment, or maybe I'll plug into this or plug into that. And we have so many different plugs we're trying to plug in to give us some energy, to give us some power in life, and, and to give us some motivation and, and some momentum. And, and we just have this whole bundle of wires that we're plugging in, and we're trying to plug them into all these different places, and we're looking to the world to fulfill something that only God can. We're plugging into power sources that have no power. And our lives are full of them. And we live in a world where from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, people are trying to unwind their power sources and figure out where they are. And there's people that spend their whole lives untangling these wires that they've put in just trying to find purpose, just trying to find love, just trying to find power, energy for life. And it's clear. 
Cursed is the one who trusts man. Cursed. It's a curse. It's a lie. It's a distraction. Where am I plugging into? And then the third one, I, I feel like this can be me at many times, and maybe you struggle with this too. It says, cursed is the one who draws strength from mere flesh. And if you see, this is a power cord plugged into itself. You know, I, I grew up with the, if you, you can do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. And that was instilled in me in school, in sports, if you want to do it and you put enough time, energy, and effort into it, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. You know, the truth is, in some ways, that's like plugging into your own power source. And it's saying, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to be the power source of my own life. I'm not going to look to anything else but me. Right? The problem is, what power can you give yourself? What power do you have to generate for your own life? And I get stuck in this trap all the time that I'm trying to plug into my own gifts and abilities to make things happen. All the issues of life, I'm trying to solve them in my own power. As a church, the temptation will be, one more program will fix our problem. One more event will fix our problem. One more thing will fix our problem because we're trying to generate power from our own ability. We're trying to generate power from us. And there's only one source of true power. There's only one source of true power. And so what's the answer? If we have these problems, we all can relate to these problems, what's the solution? Well, I believe the solution is revealed in Philippians 4, 4 through 7, and here's what it says. Rejoice in the Lord always, I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about every, anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the people of God, which transcend, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you want to know how you can know that you're plugging into the right power source? Do you have peace with God? Do you have a peace in your heart? Do you have a security in your life? Do you have a security that no matter what's going to happen, you are secure? And do you sense a guiding force, guidance in your life? Because this verse is saying to us that the power of that we are given, what, it, what, it, what it's used for is peace, security, and guidance. How helpful would that be in your life? Peace, security, and guidance is what God powers in our lives. Because God wants to do something amazing. He wants his name to be revealed. He wants his name to be lifted high so that men will be drawn to it. But for that to happen, we have to be powered by him. He didn't say, you guys do it and I'll watch. He said, you must decrease so I can increase. I'm looking for true worshipers, worshipers that, that worship in spirit and in truth. Nothing of eternal significance in your life, Nothing of eternal significance in Port Orange, in Florida, in the United States, or in the world will happen without prayer. Nothing of significance, nothing of eternal significance will happen without prayer. Prayer is the power that leads to the light shining in the darkness. Prayer is the power that allows us to overcome addiction. Prayer is the power that gives grace and peace in our lives. It allows us to have peace and security and guidance. 
We need that power desperately. We need it. And so I'm going to go to the application because today the application I think is as important as anything else. Remember, paint that's not used is pointless. We need to apply this truth. And and like I said, this is an issue for Christians. It's hard to know how do I do this prayer thing? How do I get serious about prayer? How do I apply prayer to my life? Well, I think if you look at the beginning of the Philippians verse, it says rejoice in the Lord always. It says prayer without ceasing. So how do we rejoice always? How do we pray without, pray without ceasing? And I want to give you just, just a tool, just a tool to help you to do this. If you want to do this, I want to give you a tool. And in your bulletin, in the sermon notes, this tool is there for you to look at whenever you want. You can keep it, highlight it, give it to your friends and family. This is one of the tools that Jesus gave us so that we can connect to the power. I have to connect my phone to power every night, Right? If I don't, eventually I'll just have a, com- a small computer that does nothing, right? How much do we rely on our phones? We can't rely on them if they don't have any power, right? How nervous do you get when it gets down to like 5%? You're like, uh-oh. But you know that power is nothing compared to the power that God wants to give us. And this is a tool that helps you recharge. This is a tool that helps you live in a powerful life of of Christ-centeredness and the Holy Spirit working in your life. And it's all based on what what Jesus gave us as the model prayer. See, the disciples didn't ask, um, how do we make a lot of money? Or how do we become super successful? Or even, you know, how do we do Bible study? They didn't ask about that. They asked, how do we pray? We know it's important. How should we do it? And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. This is one of the only specifics Jesus gives for how to live a committed, disciple-centered life. And he starts like this. This is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. First thing he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's the first thing you do every single day? You open your eyes. Or maybe you become awake and keep your eyes closed, right? You become aware. You become aware of the world. You were were not aware in, in the depth of your sleep. Now you're aware, right? And you begin to ask yourself questions. Am I going to hit the snooze button if that alarm is going off? Am I going to get out of bed, right? And then for some of us, our mind begins to go to, how am I going to deal with this problem? Oh yeah, there's that stress. Money, relationships, health. How am I going to deal with today? And your very first thoughts, or maybe you roll over and you pick up your phone and you go to the news and you become more and more depressed as you scroll through the headlines of the news. The very first moment in the day, The very first moment that you become conscious of the world, this tool says, Father God, you are holy, you are righteous, and you are going to be good today. And no matter what happens, no matter what happens, you're you're in charge. Because holy is your name. You're in heaven. You're coming here. Jesus is coming again. Everything's going to work out. So guess what? All those problems, finances, health, all these issues, yeah, they stink right now, but you're coming, and it might be today, so I'm excited for today. Today is a good day. You know, scientists have studied the brain, and they have also studied human nature and and how we uh, function on a day-to-day basis, and one of the things they found out is your focus in the first 10 minutes of the day has the greatest impact on your emotions for the day out of anything else. If you start the day thinking of how horrible the day is going to be, guess what? The likelihood of that being a horrible day is very high. If you start the day when you first consciously become aware and you say, my Father who's in heaven, holy is your name. Holy is your name. You are just. You are righteous. You are trustworthy. And I'm going to start this day trusting in you. I'm going to start this day believing that you are with me and you love me. 
All right, you've gotten out of bed, brush your teeth, whatever your routine is, and now you start the first physical meal of the day. You need to eat, right? We all eat. Some of you skip these, but most of us, you have breakfast. Sit down to breakfast. It's a point of reference in your day. We all can relate to it. Breakfast, I consider the purpose of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As I begin to eat my breakfast, I begin to think about all the things I have to do today, all the checklists, all the challenges, all the conversations, all the decisions I have to make today. Guess what? You've got to make a lot of decisions every single day. And at breakfast, you set aside in your mind time to say, God, I want your purposes in this decision. I want your purposes in this decision. I want your way in this decision. I want your will in this decision. I submit to your will in these things that are going to happen to me today. That's connecting. That's plugging in to the power. And when you plug into the power, you know what you get? You get an energy that gives you peace about those decisions gives you a security about those decisions. It gives you direction about those decisions because you plugged into the true power source. So you go from breakfast to lunch. Now you're sitting down at lunch and give us today our daily bread. You think about the provisions of life. You don't just need food. You need emotional stability. You need relational stability. You need financial stability, right? And so you say, Father God, you have provided to this point. You are, you're, you're trusting, I'm trusting that when you say you care about the birds, but you care about me even more, that you're going to supply my needs. You're plugging into the power source. And guess what he gives you about your needs? He gives you peace. He gives you security. And he gives you guidance about your needs. And you're plugging into the power source. You're connecting to the one who can actually provide. Then you get to early afternoon, maybe it's three or four, and you're tired, and you're angry, and you're cranky, and someone cut you off, somebody cut in line, somebody said something about you you didn't like, and this is the time you're struggling with patience. Everything is said, you're tired, you're hungry, you're a little on edge, right? It's almost time to quit your job, it's almost time to finish up and get ready for dinner, and you're at that point of, ugh, you know what you need? You need someone to pardon you, and you need to pardon somebody. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Father God, I am I'm angry. I'm, I'm a little on edge. I need your forgiveness. I need, I need to recognize you have forgiven me, and if you held these things against me, I'd be in big-time trouble. And so help me to be forgiving to, this, to every situation that's occurring in my life today. Help me to have forgiveness. Help me to give forgiveness and receive forgiveness. Help me to live in grace. And do you know what happens? You plug in. And what does he give you about all those things in your life? Because you know what we do? We hold those things in, in, in our prison, and, and we think about how angry we are about it, even if we don't act out. Because some of us, we can hold it in, and we don't act out about the things that make us angry, but we hold them in. And we're thinking about ways to get back at that. And we're thinking all day, and we're putting all of our mental energy, and we're putting all of our, our, our emotional energy into this place of torturing somebody or something. Do you know what's not true about that? There's no peace. There's no security. There's no guidance. And so you got to let that go. you got to plug in. Say, forgive, I, I got to forgive that. You, God, you, you're just, you deal with it. You take care of that. Because I need to plug into your power. I need to be connected to life. And so you get home. It's dinner time. Sit down to eat. And as you're there, you're thinking about the day. What just happened today? Why did that happen? Why did this happen? What's going to happen tomorrow? You need peace about what's just happened and what's yet to come. And so you need guidance on your path. You need to ask God to, to give you the direct and correct pathway. Lead us not into temptation, 
God, I was tempted today. I'll be tempted tomorrow. I need you to lead me so I don't fall into those temptations. You know, if you live by your gut, if you live by your emotions, you're going to fall into so many traps. You're going to fall into so much pain. You're going to fall into so many problems because your gut and your emotions don't know where to go. And so they lead you in all different places. But only when you plug into God and you say, I need your wisdom, your guidance, your path for my life, do you truly find it? And you find peace. And you find security. And you find an understanding that everything's going to be okay. Right? These are all things you can do throughout your day. You're already doing these things anyway. You're already getting up. You're already eating breakfast. You're already eating lunch. You're already cranky at four. <laughs> you're already eating dinner, right? And now you're about to go to bed. We all go to bed, right? And so when you sleep, when you sleep, you are at your most vulnerable state, aren't you? Right? What happens when people wake up in the middle of the night? There's somebody downstairs. Somebody just broke in. Go get them. Right? Because we're vulnerable. We know in our sleep we're vulnerable. And we need protection. But you know what we need more than physical protection? Spiritual protection. My spirit needs to be protected. That's why we're given an armor of God. We need to be protected. Because there's a real enemy trying to destroy me and my family. Trying to destroy this church. Trying to destroy my words. Trying to destroy God's words. Right? There's a real enemy attacking all the time. We need protection. And right before you close your eyes and go to sleep, you say, deliver me from the evil one. Deliver me from the evil one. Because there's no other thing that can deliver me. There's no other form of protection. There's no other protection that I can have other than you. Do you see how you can pray without ceasing? You can rejoice in the Lord always. You can plug in from when you wake up to when you go to bed. You can be committed to the Lord in everything that happens on every minute of every day. But it's a decision. Have I dealt with those things that are plugging up the power for me? Am I still looking to all these other things in the world for power? Am I plugging into myself? Or am I willing and desiring to connect with God every moment, to pray without ceasing. Because what would it look like in your life if every day you spent two minutes doing this at all these points? How would that affect your life? Now let's take a step back because really it's not even about us in this room. How would it affect your kid's life, your grandkids' life, your niece, your nephew's life? the ones you love, the ones you pray for, how would it affect their lives if they were taught this and they applied this to their lives, to their relationships, to their finances, to their decision-making? Do you know what the world lacks? Peace, security, and a path that leads in the right direction. You have it. We've been given it. It's a tool that's been given to us directly. Will we share that tool? Will we use that tool in our own lives? I would encourage you, sit down with someone in your life and just go through this or make up something that's similar to this in your own words and just share it with them. And If nothing else, they will have heard a way of peace, a way of hope. But it all starts with our relationship to the Father. I'm not his child until I'm born into his family. I'm not, and we're not his children until we're born into his family. And so we must be twice born. Are you twice born today? Do you know who your heavenly Father is? Do you know where your eternal home is? Do you know what family you've been adopted into? That you've taken on their, their way, his way, and his name? If not... Here's what we're called to do. 
Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you repent and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You believe, you'll be saved. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit of God becomes to dwell in your heart. And he gives you peace. And he gives you security. And he gives you guidance. This morning, maybe this is just another Sunday where we need to recommit ourselves to the things of God. If you thought about your prayer life, when's the last time you were really serious about your prayer life? When was the last time you said, I'm going to structure my day around my prayer? I'm going to be committed to, to connecting to God all throughout the day, every single day. Nothing happens by chance. It all has to be intentional. You're not going to by accident pray. You have to make that choice. That's the beauty of this life. We get to make choices. But it's also the curse of this life because it's easy to make the wrong ones. And so we need his help. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do you trust in that today? Do you believe in that today? What is the, the God of the universe who created all things saying specifically to you right now? What is he speaking into your heart? Let's pray and listen. Father God, thank you. Thank you for being the source of power. Lord, thank you for being the place of peace and security and direction. And Lord, I just, I ask, Lord, that we would not be deceived by the enemy and the enemy's tactics, but Lord, we would submit to you. Lord, we know you are holy and you are just. And you reign in heaven. We ask that as it is in heaven, it would be here right now, here on earth. Lord, give us the spiritual uh, nourishment we need right now. Help us, Lord, to know your grace and to share your grace. Lord, lead us into life. Lead us into a life that's powered by your spirit. And protect us from the enemy. Because we know you're coming back. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be years from now. But there will be a day when you return. And we look forward to that. But Lord, help us to prepare well for that. That Lord, we're not ashamed when that day comes. But that we love you more and more every day. By building that connection. By being committed to that. Lord, right now, I pray that you would make a very clear plan for us that those of us in this room that have not yet made this commitment, that they would be ready to make a commitment to a very uh, clear plan of prayer, committing to you, setting aside time to be intentionally seeking you. Lord, help us to be successful in that. Help us to be committed to that and faithful to that. In Jesus' name, amen.